and Bonani. Today we have another problem because we have LPL 4801, which is the law for sales. And we have assignment number one, which is uh, the due date is 15 March 2024. Okay, here we have some instructions. And then we are going straight to question number one. Question number one. Paul T. concludes the written agreement purchasing a motor vehicle from S. Okay, let's let let let's highlight the the motor vehicle. Let's give it a green. Motor vehicle. He purchased a motor vehicle from Susie, a motor dealer. Susie is a motor dealer. On 1 January. Let's put down here on 1 January. Let's match it with the yellow, the date. The agreement is concluded at S registered business address. So there was a contract here which was concluded at the S, at the Suzy's registered business. It's very much important to highlight the place that uh, the contract was concluded. The purchase price of the vehicle is 400,000 and is payable in 20 equal monthly installments. The agreement also makes provision for P to pay at 15% interest. Let's let highlight this one, 15% interest. Because it's very much important, let's give it in a big per annum to S in respect of the deferred purchase price. There is a term in the contract that ownership in respect of the financial will only pass to P once the installment has been paid. Okay, once the installment has been paid, okay, we knew the installment. So the ownership will change once the installment has been paid. Let's put this one down. Uh, Note this one down. The motor vehicle is delivered to P on 2 January. So this one was delivered on 2 January. He bought on the 1st, on the 2nd of January, it was delivered. P approaches you for legal advice on 4 January. Okay, let's, let's put it down uh, so that we understand. 4 January. So he bought a van, the, the agreement was concluded on the 1 of January, 1st of January, 2nd of January, the van was delivered. 1st of January, he approached me. He explains to you that although he can afford the vehicle, he has changed his mind and no longer wishes to continue with the agreement. He also informs you that he paid the first installment on 2 January and would like to claim back this installment without incurring any financial loss. S did not ask P any questions before the conclusion of the agreement. Agreement. Okay. Now we have read uh, the scenario. It's time for us to answer the questions. Number A, advise P in full on whether the National Credit Act 84 of 2005 is applicable to this agreement. Okay. Now, let's read another question. Advise P whether S has registered as a credit provider for purposes, okay? Advise P whether the stated interest rate is allowed, okay? Advise P, okay, oh, I can see those questions now. Let's start with the question number A. Advise P in full on whether the National Credit Act, the D4 of 2005, is applicable to this agreement. Okay, let's 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 start with this one. Let's advise him. Firstly, you must note down that there is a Consumer Protection Act, 2008-68 of 2008, which uh, came to effective on the 29 April 2009. Firstly, in order to answer this question, we go straight to the section five. Uh, let me show you. This is a section five of the Consumer Practice Act. 
application of the act, then we go to subsection 2, which is made it clear that this act does not apply to any transaction uh, that constitutes a credit agreement under the National Credit Act. Let me highlight this one so that uh, you understand, so that when we answer the question, you know. The very clear consumer practice act because we have to look at the on the consumer protection protection act first and it's made it clear this act does not apply to any transaction that constitute a credit agreement under the national credit act mm -hmm. but the goods and services that are subject of the credit agreement are not excluded from the ambit of this act so once we read that now, we can go to the scenario to check now. It means that there is a credit agreement that was concluded, but they made it clear that the goods are not ex uh, excluded, meaning that the motor vehicle, although it's part of the may be part of the credit agreement, is not excluded from being part of the uh, protection consumer protection act let's note this down now let's go straight to the national credit act 2005 34 2005 which became effective on 15 march 2006 then we head straight to the credit agreement on section 8 of the national credit act uh, what constitutes a credit agreement. They said that uh, the credit agreement, what constitutes a credit agreement is a credit facility, a credit transaction, a credit guarantee, and any combination of the above. And it also stated clear that the agreement will not be credit if it includes a policy of insurance, uh, those that you pay monthly to pay, pay premiums like AFBOB, they are not going to be part of the credit agreement. A lease of immovable property such as a house, they are not part of the credit agreement. It is, if it is the form of a lease or any transaction between a stock sale and a members of the stock sale in accordance with the rules of the stock sale. So stock sales that people play are not part of the credit agreement. Now we know that there's a credit facility, there's a credit transaction, there's a credit guarantee in order to constitute it to be a credit agreement. But there is, before we deal with, the, with this uh, credit facility or credit transaction or credit guarantee, we have to look into the first uh, requirement of the of the of the constitute the credit agreement. Here they made it clear that okay. Well, let me let me let me start here. Yeah, let me come here. The requirement number one is that there should be any charge fee or interest which is payable to the credit provider in respect of any amount desired as contemplated in paragraph. So this, this uh, is the first requirement to constitute to be a credit agreement, that there should be a charge or fee or interest which is and this is proven by the case of the Voltex uh, Visas Chenleza or Chenleza, where the High Court held that an agreement of a sale that provides for the purchase price to be paid after delivery of the goods, but with no interest, charge or fee payable for the credit extended, does not constitute a credit agreement, which in, uh, which is proof that the fee, the charge, or the interest are the first requirement 
to constitute a credit agreement. So if we can go back to our scenario, there was a 15% interest per annum we should be uh, paid to the desired purchase price. We shows that this may constitute a credit agreement. So there's a 15% interest, and now we can see that it is uh, the requirement of the credit, uh, the credit, uh, 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 national credit has been met. Now, now let's look at the credit transaction. A credit transaction, it constitutes a found agreement, a discount transaction, and installment agreement. And here we look at the installment agreement because the scenario deals with installment agreement. So we we'll look onto the installment. An installment agreement is defined as a sale of movable property. Movable property. We should not down this one movable property where all or part of the purchases price is defined and is paid by periodic payment, possession and use of property is transferred to the consumer and ownership either passes immediately or subject to a right of the credit provider to repossess the property if the consumer fails to satisfy his or her obligation under the argument or on satisfaction of the consumer's financial obligation under the argument. This is perhaps the most common phenomenon of credit transaction. On this scenario, we can see that there is a motor vehicle that was uh, purchased based on the installment, and there is a term in the contract that ownership and respect of the vehicle will only pass to P once the last installment has been paid. So it means that he has to pay a, a monthly installment in full to get the ownership. Now we know that uh, uh, it constitutes a national credit act based on section and uh, section eight, which deals with a credit transaction. So it constitutes a, a, a national is part of the national credit based on the uh, credit transaction under the installment agreement. Now we know, and they even gave the example. So when we conclude, the National Credit Act of 2005 is applicable, and we have proven that it's applicable. But don't forget that the motor vehicle that was, uh, that, that, that was uh, delivered uh, can also be part of a Consumer uh, Protection Act. Don't forget that. Now let's go to number B. Advise P whether S is to register as a credit provider for the purposes of the agreement above. In the, in the, uh, uh, let me just say uh, before the National Credit Act or after the National Credit Act. Uh, not all uh, agreements were, were, were registered, but now all agreements must be registered anyway. It, it, is, uh, it, was, uh, it is amended, so all must be registered. But we have to prove that, firstly, you must know that as a credit provider, you have to register under the National Credit Regulator. There are National Credit Regulator which you have to register your credit agreement. Uh, it's contemplated in Section 14 of the National Credit Act. So here, according to Section 42, on the effective date and at interval of not more than five years, the minister by notice in the Gazette he must determine threshold of not less than 500,000 for the purpose of determining whether the credit provider is required to be registered in terms of Section 40. Initial threshold determined by the Minister in terms of this section takes effect 
on the effective date and each subsequent threshold takes effect six months after the date which has been published. So this is talking about uh, the credit agreement which must be registered. And they said that the one that must be registered must not be less than 500,000 for that time. However, I told you that that section has been amended and now we have a new, it was amended by a government gazette uh, of 14 February 2016. Uh, the written year before the amendment came into operation through the 20, 2014 Amendment Act, the threshold could not be less than 500,000. However, this is no longer a requirement. And in terms of this notice in the government gazette of 4 February 2016, it is clear that the Minister of Trade and Industry is in the process of setting that threshold to zero. So when they, they were writing this study guide, the, the, the operation or the government gazette of 4 February was not into the operation. But now it's 2024 and we have already passed 2016. Now we can make it clear that all the, the threshold, uh, the thresholds are set into zero. Thresholds are set to zero in 20. 24, which means that um, each and every uh, credit agreement must be registered regardless of the threshold. Regardless of the threshold, now we know. So we have answered the question as as to register as a credit provider the credit agreement uh, because now the credit, the threshold is set to zero. Now we know. Okay, let's go to number C. Advise P whether the stated interest rate is allowed in terms of the NCA. Well, the interest rate is determined each and every year or after five years, I don't know, but you can actually check the interest rate which is allowed based on the National Credit Act. Always calculated by the minister. This one is up to you to, to find it. You just have to check the National the Gazette one, the international, uh, the interest rate which is gazetted uh, recently. Then this one, I believe uh, you will answer it. Number D, advise P if there are any remedies available to him in terms of the NCA. Advise P if there are any remedies available to him in terms of the NCA, in terms of the act. It's never stated that it's in terms of consumer practice, that it's said that in terms of the NCA. Remember, uh, he, he is no longer wishes to continue with the agreement, and he paid two installments, uh, and he would like to claim back his installment without incurring any financial loss. So he want to opt out from the credit agreement. Okay. That's why we have to go straight to the section 121, which talks about the cooling off, which is part of the rescission and or termination of credit agreement. It is stated very clear that this section applies only in respect of the lease or an installment agreement, which this one, it means that, remember the one that we are dealing with is based on the installment agreement, means that it's applicable. However, let's go forward. Installment agreement entered into any location other than registered business premises. Entered into any location other than the registered business premises of the credit provider. This scenario made it clear that Susie and Paul concluded the, 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 the credit agreement at Susie's registered business address, meaning that the Section 121, the remedy that is available to Paul, is now constrained by the fact that the contract was concluded at the S registered business address. Subsection 2, 
a consumer may terminate a credit agreement within five business days after the date of which the agreement was signed by the consumer by delivering a notice tendering the return of the of any money or goods or or paying in full for any services or received by the consumer in respect of the agreement. Let's check. The agreement was concluded on the 1st of January, delivered on the 2nd of, 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 of January, then he approaches you on the 4th of January. It means that the five working business days has not lapsed. Then this guy still have a chance here. And then subsection 3 said when a credit agreement is terminated in terms of this section, the credit provider must refund any money that consumer is paid under the agreement within seven day business days after the delivery of the notice to terminate. Unfortunately, section 121, the remedy that is available for P will not be applicable because the agreement was concluded at the registered business address of the of the credit provider. It is stated in the mind that P was informed and he took a necessary decision when he concluded a credit agreement. To emphasize more on that is that you must remember that uh, it's a general principle of the law of the contract that uh, the contract cannot just be terminated any time willy-nilly. It should be of a matter of a, a material, uh, if there is a breach of the material to the contract. They stated here very clear that whether the credit provider is entitled to cancel or terminate the credit agreement will be determined by the general principles of the law of contract. The contract must either contain a clause entitling the credit provider to cancel the agreement in the event of a particular breach of the contract, or the breach must be material to the contract. So as a result of that, P cannot just wake up and decide to terminate the credit agreement based on the fact that it's no longer loving the car. If you go to the to the car dealer, you will be informed much about uh, your 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 whether you credit score or pay slip enable you to be approved for certain installments. Therefore, you are well informed. You cannot just come back and 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 terminate the contract. So that one will not be applicable. However, Paul has a remedy in terms of Section 122 of the NCA. It's stated very clear that a consumer may terminate a credit agreement at any time by paying the settlement amount to the credit provider in accordance with Section 125. It's stated very clear in addition to Subsection 1, a consumer may terminate an installment agreement, required loan or lease of movable property by surrendering to the credit provider the goods that are subject of that agreement in, court, in accordance with Section 127 and paying to the credit provider any remaining amount demanded in accordance with, the, with Section 127. So uh, this is the only remedy that is available to Paul. Section 122 is the available remedy because the cooling off in terms of Section 121 will not be applicable to Paul. However, Section 122 will be applicable to Paul if he made all these requirements that are listed on Section 120. Then we go to the last question, what effect will the clause in the contract excluding the liability of S for any latent defects in the triangle have if the NCA did not apply? Discuss briefly. What effect will the clause in the contract excluding the liability of S for any latent defects in the triangle have if the NCA did not apply? Discuss briefly. Uh, in order to understand, we just read the scenario about the influence of ex on existing law. 
it stated very clear that adhering to the principle of contractual freedom, the courts have always shielded away from concluding a contract on behalf of the parties. In a radical departure from this approach, certain terms and conditions are no longer allowed in a contract, whether it was agreed upon or not. An example will be the Fort Hood Clause, because it is a clause that will purportedly deprive the consumer of a right in terms of the CPA. We should read with Section 51 of the CPA, the right to goods of a good quality as discussed in study unit. Many other st standard terms that have been included in contracts to the gentleman of the consumer are now prohibited. The list of the terms prohibited in the CPA is similar to the list of unlawful terms found in the section 89 of the NCA, which is applicable to credit agreements governed by the NCA. Now, let it, let's be clear that Section 89 of the NCA, uh, subsection 5, made it clear that uh, the credit agreement is unlawful in terms of this section, despite any provision of common law, any other legislation, or any provision of agreement to the contrary, and the court must order that the credit agreement is void. But the problem here is that they said that if the latent defects in the financial health, if the NCA did not apply. So if the Section 89 is not applicable, we made it clear in the beginning that the motor financial is not only subject to the NCA, it's also subject to the consumer. Therefore, if the NCA is not applicable, still the CPA will take effect and the right to goods of quality in terms of Section 56 will be applicable and still, the Fuert Stood Clause will not be in the effect. So, Fuert Stood Clause will not be applicable whether the NCA is not applicable or whether it's applicable. So, today we're dealing with a law of the sales, and thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll see each other on other modules.